Hi, I'm Matt Dickin, and this is Strategic Wealth. Here's what's coming up on today's show. I want to compare the differences between mutual funds and exchange-traded funds. Live on about $10,000 to maybe $30,000 per year. And we're going to be answering your email questions. It's something that I really enjoyed. That's just a little bit of what you're going to see right now. Welcome to this week's show. Thank you for tuning in. As usual, we have a lot of great information we're going to be bringing to you that you can use for both yourself and your family. We're going to be going over a high-tech edition of X's and O's. We have a very special radio show that's one of my personal favorites that we'll take a look at. And we're going to be answering your email questions. It's something that I really enjoy doing. But before we get into all of that, let's get started with this week's Money Minute. Okay, for this week's Money Minute, I wanted to do things a little bit differently because I want to compare the differences between mutual funds and exchange-traded funds. ETFs, as they're commonly referred to, are becoming more and more popular, but I think a lot of people don't understand the, the real differences. So I wanted to go to the whiteboard and cover some of their main features that might sound similar, but obviously do make a difference. Uh, number one, what a mutual fund is, is it's basically just a collection of stocks or bonds. So a fund manager goes out and purchases any number of stocks uh, or maybe different types of bonds and then they manage that portfolio. So they're trying to generate a positive return or trying to generate some sort of dividend uh, or interest for you. This is one area where they're very similar because an exchange traded fund is also just a collection of stocks and bonds. Okay, so on the surface they sound very, very similar, but that's probably about the only thing that they have in common. One of the things we talk about on the show all the time are fees. So if you take a look at your management fee on a mutual fund, it might be very, very reasonable, it could be unreasonable. Right now your average management fee on a mutual fund in this country today is gonna be right at 1.5% per year. Okay, so on an annual basis, they're charging you 1.5% on average to manage the portfolio, the, uh, portfolio for you. An exchange-traded fund is going to have a management fee typically at about 0.25%. In some cases, it's even lower than that. So from a fee standpoint, uh, mutual funds are much more expensive than an ETF. The second thing that's different about them is turnover. Okay, so we've talked about turnover on the show in the past. On a mutual fund, the fund manager is in there buying and selling different stocks and bonds. Every time they buy and sell something, there's a cost for that because uh, you can't buy a stock or a bond without some sort of transaction cost. And typical uh, fees for turnover are 1% transaction per transaction. Uh, the average turnover on a mutual fund right now is 75%. So what that means is there's an additional 0.75% per year on average for the turnover cost. So when you add the two fees together, we're above 2% annually. Over here on an exchange traded fund, they're buying a set of stocks or bonds. They're not actively managing the account. So there isn't any turnover or very little turnover. So you might have about another 0.1% uh, when you take a look at your average ETF. So from a fee standpoint, they really are night and day. Now, because of the turnover and the way that the two different strategies are treated from a tax standpoint, you have what we refer to on a mutual fund as triple taxation. So you pay three different types of tax on a mutual fund, if it's in a taxable account. So you're gonna pay short-term capital gains tax, long-term capital gains tax, as well as uh, potentially a dividend tax. On the ETF, you either have one or two taxes. Okay, so from a tax standpoint, if you're gonna have an ETF in a regular taxable account, again, less cost over here because there's no portfolio turnover you're only going to pay one or two different types of tax. The fifth difference between the two uh, is, and this is a big one, mutual funds can only be bought or sold at 4 p.m. So they're always bought or sold at 4 p.m. So if you put the order in at 9 or 10 or 11 o'clock in the morning, it doesn't matter. You're going to get the price at whatever it's trading at at 4 p.m. That can either help you or hurt you. You know, if the stock market's declining and you're trying to sell your mutual fund, well, you've got to wait till it rides the entire uh, uh, you know, trading session down 
you're going to sell at whatever price you get at 4 p.m. You can't lock in the price or, the, or its value uh, before you go through a big decline. Same thing if you want to buy the fund. If, if, if things look like there's going to be an uptick and you're trying to go in and buy the fund at the right price, well, you can't. You put the order in. Whatever the market's at at uh, 4 p.m. Is, is what you're going to have to pay or sell it at. Uh, over here on the ETFs, uh, they trade openly. So at any point during the day, you can uh, buy or sell the ETF. So again, if you get some bad news overnight and you want to sell off the position before the stock market goes through a correction, well, potentially you could do that. Same thing if you think the market's going to run up because we got some good economic news overnight. Well, you can put in an order at any time that the market is open. So a very, very big difference. Now, the sixth and last difference I'm going to bring up with you here today is with a mutual fund, you cannot use what's called a stop loss. So there's no stop on a mutual fund. What this is talking about is without having to call and get the timing right, if you want to, you can put what's called a stop loss on a stock or, or an ETF or different types of securities, which says that if the price or the value of it falls by a certain percentage amount uh, at any point in time, it'll be sold automatically. So say if you're willing to stomach a 5 or 10% decline in the market, but you don't want to go any further than that, you could set an automatic sell order if the market starts to struggle and starts to go down in value. Uh, with some securities, you can't do that with a mutual fund. Again, you just have to put the order in. you got to get the timing right. And no matter when you put the order in, it's going to trade at 4 p.m. Uh, with the ETF, we can use a stop loss. So we can, if we are using an ETF to uh, maybe produce some sort of an income or if it's some sort of a dividend paying ETF, uh, right now you can find them paying maybe 6 or 7% dividend. If you want to, you can put an automatic order in. So if the market were to fall by maybe 4 or 5%, it would automatically be sold and your money would be moved to cash. Again, since it has the benefit that it openly trades throughout the day, you're not limited to just whatever the price is at 4 p.m. So I think there's a big difference between mutual funds and ETFs. I think that using an exchange-traded fund is probably a little better risk-based option uh, than what a mutual fund would be. But before you invest in either of these two investment vehicles, uh, you do want to talk to a professional and really talk to them and see what would be best for your situation. Now, if you have any other questions about mutual funds or exchange-traded funds, don't hesitate to call the office. And of course, that's this week's Money Minute. And now it's time for this week's Facebook poll question. At what age do you think you will retire? Well, I used to think I could retire around 60, 65, what was considered maybe the norm, but now I really don't even think about retirement. I'd like to retire at 65, but in today's economy, I just don't think that's going to happen. Um, realistically, it'll probably be more like I want to say 70 before I'll be able to retire. Well, what age do I hope to retire? What age do I want to retire? I'd like to retire around 60, but probably closer to 70. As you can tell, the responses are all over the place. We're seeing individuals delaying their retirement, and it used to be everybody kind of targeted age 65. I'm seeing individuals pushing that back to maybe 67, 68, even some individuals working into their 70s. But while you're at our Facebook page, don't forget to like us so you can join our Facebook community and stay up to date on news that you can use to have a successful retirement. Be sure to stick around because after the break, we're going to be going to X's and O's. and We're going to do it a little bit differently this week. I think you're going to learn a lot. You're watching Strategic Wealth with Matt Dickin. It's Smart Money Television. Come see Matt live and discover what millions of safety conscious Americans are doing now to protect and preserve their assets and make up for market losses. Will recent legislation changes affect your retirement? Can you safeguard your assets from unnecessary taxation? Can you find growth and security without risk in today's volatile market? Due to overwhelming demand for these events and very limited seating, we recommend that you call today, 855-MATT-DICKEN. That's 855-MATT-DICKEN, or go to askmattdicken.com. You're watching Strategic Wealth with Matt Dickin. It's Smart Money Television. This week, I wanted to do things a little bit different and talk about our retirement analyzer software that we use all the time in the office. I get questions from time to time when I meet with people face to face or maybe some of the emails that some of you have sent to us or some of the phone calls that we get. And individuals will say, Matt, when can I retire? Or can I retire? Or now that I am retired, how much money can I take out of my account? We'll get questions like, should I pay my mortgage off or not? Can I afford to help my child or grandchild start a business? 
you know, my wife and I have always thought about buying a vacation home. Can we really afford to do that? And a lot of times you can sit down, you can analyze your situation and try and make some projections and kind of give an educated guess as far as if you can do those things or if you can retire successfully and if your money will last you as long as you need it to. But a lot of times it's just that. It's just an educated guess. You don't really know for sure. So one of the things that we do with a lot of our clients in our office is we use the specialized software which will take a look at everything in your situation. We, we take a look at obviously your retirement assets, but we also consider whether or not you have any pension income that's going to be coming in once you retire. We'll take a look at if you own any rental property and maybe that'll generate positive cash flow. We can take a look at uh, things like inflation, taxes, uh, and we project basically how long will your money last. And, and the software that we use will actually project things all the way out to age 100. So we can take a look at until you and your spouse are age 100, will your money last as long as you need it to? And if it won't last, the software will actually produce what we call a red line and warn us. And sometimes when we run the analysis, we'll see that individuals have plenty of money to reach their goals. The money's going to last as long as they need it to. Other times we'll see that individuals are going to run out of money at age 94 or 95, something like that. And a lot of times when we see that, individuals will say, well, Matt, I'm just going to risk it. That's fine. But other times we'll see where individuals are going to run out of money maybe in their early 80s or late 70s. Well, obviously for most folks that would present a problem. So once we see how long the money will last, we can then see, well, what changes can we make to your current assets or your current lifestyle and see if we can make the money last even longer than what your current situation looks like. Once we've built the analysis, we can then play what-if scenarios. You know, what if one of us passes away or what if one of us has to go into a nursing home or some other type of uh, facility? What if taxes go a lot higher or inflation takes off? We can run all those different scenarios and see what the impact will be. And it's no longer guesswork. It'll show you exactly what will happen. And one of the big things I really like about the software is the fact that once we're done, it'll produce a, a report for you, but it's not 80 or 90 pages of analysis with lots of confusing charts and graphs. Depending on your situation, it usually puts out about a six, maybe eight, maybe ten page report that you can take home. Both you and your spouse can uh, analyze it. And then, of course, we can make changes. Once we've built it, it's very, very easy. So what I want to do today is just walk you through a generic example of some of the things that we take a look at when we use the software. And what I have here is we're going to call them uh, Joe and Jane Smith. And this is a pretty common situation that we see when individuals come into our office. Uh, Joe is 67 years old, Jane is 64 years old, and they're both already retired. Now, because they gave us their information, we knew exactly how much money they're generating from Social Security, as well as any pension income that they might have. With the software, we can also take a look at their current retirement assets, and we can take a look at both what the risk level is on their current assets, as well as what the rate of return is that they're generating. So this particular client came in, they had about $500,000 in their uh, IRA accounts. All of it was at risk in the stock market. Uh, when I was talking with them, they told me that they really didn't want to have that much risk. They, they really only wanted to have about 20% of their money exposed to risk. They wanted about 80% of their money safe. Well, obviously, they, were, they had a, a lot of work to do in that regard. Uh, with their uh, Social Security, and the retirement nest egg and their pensions, they were hoping to generate about $4,000 per month of annual income, and they wanted us to assume a 3% inflation rate. One of the big concerns that they had is right now their investment accounts were generating enough money for them to maintain their standard of living, but they were concerned about the fact that over a 10 or a 15 or 20 year period, inflation was going to uh, do a lot of damage to their spendable dollars. So basically, once we input everything into the system, we can then go down and take a look at their actual retirement situation where it takes into consideration, again, their current age, how much money they're getting from Social Security, how much money they're drawing from their investment accounts, and it shows basically what happens to their retirement funds. Now, if you remember earlier, I said if we were going to run into a problem, it basically will produce a red line, and that's kind of a warning signal. It's showing that this particular couple would run out of money if they just keep doing exactly what they're doing, they're going to run out of money when he's 83 and she's going to be 80 years old. So obviously that was a big concern for them. If they just continue to do what they were doing, they were actually going to run out of money uh, a little earlier than what they had hoped for and a little earlier than what they had planned for. 
So what we can do is then take a look at, well, how do we fix this problem? What are some things that can be done? Uh, sometimes individuals will say, you know what, I've got a little part-time job. I'm just going to continue working that for another year or two. How does that impact my scenario? Other times individuals will say, you know what, I'm done working. I don't want to go back to work. Whatever our nest egg is, we've got to find a way to make it last. So what can we do that's better? And let me pull up a different scenario for that. Okay, so now what we've done here is we've taken a, a look at a different scenario. Uh, and an individual comes into my office with this type of problem where they're going to run out of money earlier. I then go back and do analysis of what they currently have, and I research the marketplace. A lot of times individuals are looking for guaranteed income for life, and I wanted to see if there was anything that would maybe suit them a little better. So again, we have the same scenario. We're calling them Joe and Jane Smith. And what we did is we just repositioned some of their assets into different income annuities that are available in the marketplace. We, we took their money out of the mutual funds that they had. We rolled them over to income annuities where they still had access to their lump sum of money if they needed it. But the big benefit was that now they were going to generate guaranteed income for life. So we were able to move them from an environment where 100% uh, of their money was at risk to 100% of their money is now safe. And we were able to move them from what I call maybe income, you know, maybe their retirement accounts would generate the income. When we ran the analysis, we saw that it wasn't going to last for them. Uh, but now that we've repositioned things, they're now in a situation where we know the income's going to be there for as long as they live. So we just rolled the accounts over. Uh, in this particular situation, there weren't any taxes that were due, uh, no penalties that they had to pay. Sometimes there are taxes and penalties, so you want to take that into consideration. We have the same retirement goal. They want $4,000 per month to live on. And now if we take a look at the impact that we had on their retirement plan, remember earlier we had what we call a red line where they would run out of money at age 83 and 80. Now the software says just simply because we repositioned their assets in a little uh, more appropriate setting, now the money lasts them forever. This shows that all the way out to age 100 for both spouses, they've generated all the income that they need, they've kept up with inflation, and they still have roughly, in this scenario, about $4 million that they can pass on to their heirs and their beneficiaries when they pass away. So obviously, even if inflation were to go much, much higher or taxes were to go higher, they're still going to be in pretty good shape just because they simply repositioned a few of their assets. Now, again, once we've built this uh, particular uh, situation or scenario for you, we can then play the what-if games. We can play the what-if scenario of what if the market crashes? What type of an impact will that have? Uh, what if we change the inflation rate? You know, we're assuming an average inflation rate, but some people believe that inflation is going to go to 5 or 6, maybe even 7 percent in the future. We've certainly seen it in the past. Uh, what if taxes go much higher? This will calculate what state that you live in and how much you're going to have to pay in federal and state income taxes through your retirement. Uh, it'll take into consideration whether you have taxable accounts or tax-free accounts. It, it really takes everything into consideration. But what happens if tax rates go much higher? Well, well, now will the money last forever? Again, the question that I talked about earlier, you know, what if you want to buy a retirement home or, or loan money to a, a child or a grandchild? Or what if you want to pay for the grandkids to go to college? We can play all of those what if scenarios and see what the impact will be. And it shows us, you know, in plain black and white exactly how long the money will last. One of my favorite things to have happen when we run this particular, these types of analysis in my office is I'll meet with somebody that'll say, Matt, I'm thinking, of re I'm thinking of retiring in two or three years, not really sure if we can, not sure if we can afford it, but we're looking for some help. Sometimes we'll be able to run the analysis, analysis and I'll come back to the individuals and say, hey, you know what, you don't have to retire in two or three years, you're ready to retire today. And sometimes they go ahead and retire. Uh, other times they continue to work. But what's nice in those scenarios is now they know that they're working not because they have to, but because they want to. And if things just get unbearable or the boss upsets them, they know that they can walk out the door if they want, and they're still going to be able to have a successful retirement. So we really like this particular analysis. It's very simple, very easy to use, very easy to understand, and it can answer all of those what-if questions that I know a lot of you watching the show right now probably have. And that's this week's X's and O's. Hopefully you've been able to see the benefit of using software such as this. If you have questions about it or would like to see your scenario run through the program, don't forget to contact the office. Stick around because we'll be right back after a short break. You're watching Strategic Wealth with Matt Dickin. It's Smart Money Television. Come see Matt live and discover what millions of safety conscious Americans are doing now to protect and preserve their assets and make up for market losses. 
Will recent legislation changes affect your retirement? Can you safeguard your assets from unnecessary taxation? Can you find growth and security without risk in today's volatile market? Due to overwhelming demand for these events and very limited seating, we recommend that you call today, 855-MATT-DICKEN. That's 855-MATT-DICKEN or go to askmattdicken.com. You're watching Strategic Wealth with Matt Dicken. It's smart money television. And now let's take a look at one of my favorite subjects that we covered on a previous radio show. You know, Matt, when the staff and I prepare the show, one question that we get quite often is, you know, should I work with my banker at the bank? Should I work with a stockbroker at a big wirehouse? What's the difference between the two? Okay, that's probably a good opportunity, Mark, to talk about the three different investment worlds that uh, individual investors have to choose so from. So there's right more now. than just the two. There's a, there's yeah, multiple. There's basically three. Basically, there are. Okay, okay. there's really th uh, really three different areas where there's companies competing for your retirement nest egg or your investment dollars. Of course, there, there's the bank way of doing things. So if you go talk with someone that works at a bank or represents a bank, they're probably going to recommend CDs or savings accounts, money market accounts, things of that nature. So let's let's put it let's put it this way. Let's say you have a million dollars and you invested your money the bank way. Well, right now CDs are paying about one percent, really, if you're lucky. Not terribly attractive. Not too terribly mm -hmm. attractive. Okay, historically they've been a little higher. So basically, if you have a million dollars in an investment account and you want to do things the bank way, then you could probably generally live on about ten thousand to maybe thirty thousand dollars per year of income, and probably never have to worry about running out of money. But the problem right now is if you're relying on CDs, again, if they're only paying 1%, inflation is historically mm -hmm. at about 4%. Now, over the last few years, it hasn't been that big of a deal, but we know inflation will go much, much higher in the future. So that'll kind of bring us to the second option, and that's kind of the Wall Street way. If you talk with someone that's a stockbroker or represents one of the large uh, investment firms, they're going to recommend that you put your money at risk in the stock market as a way of keeping up with inflation. And, you know, sometimes that works out well, and then other times mm -hmm. it doesn't. But if you're going to do things the Wall Street way, you're going to have risk, you're going to have fees that you have to be concerned about, and you basically have to be your own pension manager. It's up to you to make sure that you invest your money appropriately to make sure that it lasts you as long as you need it to last you for the rest of your life. Now, AARP recently came out with a study, and they said that investors that are relying on mutual funds, stocks, and bonds – to provide them a retirement income should take no more than 4% out of the account each and every year if they want that money to last forever. So again, a million dollar account, the individual could probably safely take about $40,000 per year. That's assuming if we don't see another dramatic drop in the market like we saw a few years back. So, you know, kind of the Wall Street way, you might be able to get about $40,000 in income, whereas the bank way is maybe 10, 20, or 30,000. Now, there's a third way that you could have your money invested, and that's basically the insured way or by working with some sort of an insurance company or a component. Now, there you're going to have guarantees. You shift the risk from your shoulders to their shoulders, and typically, depending on your age, you'll be able to withdraw somewhere between 6 7 or 8% of the portfolio per year, and that money will be guaranteed to be there as long as you live. So again, if you have a million dollars and you go the insured way of doing things, you could maybe draw sixty, seventy, or eighty thousand out of the account each and every year. You know, maybe two to three times what doing things the bank way will allow you to do, and maybe about double in some cases what doing things the Wall Street way will allow you. That's to do. a significant difference. It's We're a not talking about difference. Absolutely, you know, th that's significant. L let me ask you this though. Obviously, we know about the FDIC. If I put mm -hmm. my money in the local bank. Mm -hmm. I know that up to $250,000 there is guaranteed by the U.S. government. Right. You say that there are guarantees with the insurance company. It's not FDIC, right? It's something different. No, it's not FDIC, but it's what's called the Guarantee Association Fund. So depending on what state you live in, different states have different limits. Obviously, FDIC is 250000 no matter where you live. Mm -hmm. But when you have an account that's with one of these insured structures, you're still going to be covered in the state of Kentucky and Indiana. You're going to be covered up to $250,000. So they're similar. Account. They're they're very similar in they're the way that they, similar, they operate. But, but they are different. They mm -hmm. are different pools of money that are protecting them. Of course, the Wall Street way, there's no guarantee. No, no, no guarantee right? at all. It's up to you. 
You know, Matt, something that you talk about is the fiduciary responsibility. And I know that's probably our 50 cent word of the day, but it's real important. And people need to know what this means, Mm -hmm. because if you're going to go the bank way, the Wall Street way or the insurance way, there's Mm -hmm. a very very different responsibility from uh, advisor to client. Right. Yeah. And what you're talking about there is if you work with a registered representative of a bank, that's very important to ask them what they are. Are they a registered representative of a bank or a Wall Street firm? If they are, they have a fiduciary responsibility to the firm in which they're employed by, meaning they have to do what's in the best interest of their firm, you know, whether it's a bank or a big brokerage firm. Now, if you work with someone that works with a registered investment advisory firm, they might be an RIA or they could be an investment advisor representative, either one of those two, they will have a fiduciary responsibility to the client meaning they have to do what's in the best interest of the client. So most investors think that everybody that's in the industry is held to the same standard, but they're not. Mm -hmm. I don't think it should be that way, but unfortunately that's the way that it is. So depending on what type of advice you're going to get, a lot of times is skewed by who that individual actually works for, who their employer is. So I'm an investor right now, and I'm looking for someone where their major responsibility should be me, not the institution that they work for. Right. What kind of questions can I ask? Because I might be with someone that I've been with for a long time mm-hmm. thinking that their main responsibility is me, mm-hmm. when in fact it may not be. Right. A basic question is who, who holds the fiduciary standard? Or do they have to do what's in the best interest of the firm that they work for? Or are they bound by a different set of regulatory standards that requires them to act in the best interest of their client? It's a simple question. They'll certainly know the answer to it. Well, let me say this. Uh, I'm the type of investor, I want a little bit of everything. I want some of my money in the bank. I want some of my money in the market. I want some of my money with an insurance company. What do I do now? Mm Mm-hmm. Well, you could work with an independent advisor that has access to all of those different areas. So if you work, again, with a registered investment advisor, they're going to have access to CDs and checking accounts. They can give you mutual funds, stocks, and bonds if that's appropriate. And then, of course, they'll be able to do things the insured way as well. Great. Folks, keep those questions coming. Again, you go to askmattdicken.com. Once you get to the site, you'll see the banner that says Ask Matt Dicken. And again, we'll field those questions for you. You're listening to The Matt Dickens Show, where safe money is smart money. Well, that's our show for this week. Thank you once again for watching. And keep in mind, retirement planning is a journey, not a destination. I'll see you next time.